The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We're going to end the unit on synthesis today. And the focus of today's lecture will really be looking at one system in detail and the types of experiments that are done to elucidate um, a biosynthetic pathway um, for a non-ribosomal peptide. And so just to recap um, from last time, if we think about studying um, assembly lines in lab, and we're thinking about this for a non-ribosomal peptide synthetase, um, what needs to be done? So first, it's necessary to typically overexpress and purify um, domains, didomains, or modules. And so on Monday, it came up that often um, these proteins are enormous, and it's not possible or feasible to express entire modules or entire proteins that have multiple modules. So oftentimes, people will look at individual domains um, or didomains, which are smaller and more amenable to overexpression in an organism like E. coli. Then it's necessary to assay um, for A domain activity. So recall the A domains are the adenylation domains. And the question is, what monomer is selected and activated? And so the ATP PPI exchange assay comes up here. There needs to be assays okay, for loading of the T domain or carrier protein with the monomer. Okay, assay for peptide bond formation. Okay, which is the condensation domain. And then often some assay for chain release by the thioesterase domain. OK, so assay for TE activity. Chain release. Okay. And so in terms of think, thinking about these T domains, right? we learned that these T domains need to be post-translationally modified with the PPANT arm, which means we need an enzyme called a PPTase. Okay? And so in many cases, we don't know what the PPTase is for a given gene cluster. Um, and what's done often in the lab is that a PPTase from B. subtilis named SFP um, is used in order to post-translationally modify the T domains with the PPAN arm. So there's a serine residue in these T domains that gets modified. We looked over that um, in a prior lecture. Um, so this one is very useful. And if you don't know, the enzyme to use, people will use recombinant SFP. Um, and just recall, we have the T domain. There's a serine moiety. We have a PPTase that's going to stick on the PPAN arm here. So we call this APO, HOLO, and then the amino acid or aryl acid monomer in the case of NRPS gets loaded here via a thioester. Okay, and so SFP can be used to get us here. Um, and even what people have done is make modified analogs where there's some R group. So you could imagine using chemical synthesis to load a monomer. 
or even some other type of group that for some reason you might want to transfer here. And this SFP is very promiscuous and it can do that. Okay, and so um, the take home here is if you need a PPTase, you know, overexpress, purify, and utilize SFP. Here's just an example um, for review where we have a carrier protein, so a T domain, and we have um, the PPTase activity here, SFP, attaching this PPAN arm. Um, and here it's described with an R group. And just to give you an example of possibilities here, um, there have been many reports of CoA analogs being transferred to T domains by SFP. And these can range from things like an isotope label um, to peptides to steroids um, to some you know, non-ribosomal peptide derivative or, or fluorophore. Um, so this has been used as a tool. And you might ask, why is this possible? Um, and if we just take a look at the structure of SFP from B. subtilis um, with CoASH and magnesium bound, what we see is that this end um, of the CoA is extended out into the solvent, right? And at least in this um, structure here, it's not interacting with the regions of the protein. So you can imagine that it's possible to attach some group, even a bulky group here, um, and be able to transfer it there. So where we're going to focus the rest of um, the lecture is on an assembly line responsible for the biosynthesis of a natural product called enterobactin, and this is a siderophore. Um, and so in thinking about this, what I would just like to first note is that when we talk about these assembly lines, we can group them into two types. Um, which are non-iterative and iterative assembly. And so what does this mean? So we've seen examples of non-iterative assembly last time on Monday with the ACV tripeptide and the vancomycin synthetase. So in these non-iterative assembly lines, um, effectively each step has its own module. So each carrier protein, T domain, each you know, condensation or catalytic domain is used only once um, as the chain grows. And we see the chain passed along from module to module um, here. So also um, the PKS we looked at, at for um, synthesis of DBB is one of these non-iterative assembly lines. So in contrast, and the example we're going to look at today with the enterobactin synthetase is an iterative assembly line. And this is similar to what we saw in fatty acid synthase. So in these iterative assembly um, lines, effectively only one module is employed over and over again. So you can have the same carrier protein and same catalytic domain um, used for multiple cycles of chain elongation. Right? And that's what we saw in fatty acid synthase where there are multiple cycles of addition of a C2 unit via um, the, same, the same domains. And so what we're going to see today is this type of iterative assembly is responsible for the synthesis of this molecule here. Okay. So first, um, just an overview of building blocks. And then we'll talk about why um, organisms want to make this molecule and then, then focus on the biosynthetic logic and experiments. Um, so this molecule, enterobactin, is produced from two monomers. So we have 2,3-dihydroxybenzoic acid, or DHB, and we have serine here. And there is a two-module assembly line responsible for the synthesis of this natural product. And that assembly line is shown here. So we see that there's three um, proteins, and E, and B, and and F. We have an initiation module elongation module, and this TE domain for termination. So overall, three separate proteins, two um, modules, and seven domains. So, so this NRPS is quite small. Um, and this is an example of a non-ribosomal peptide that's produced by E. coli. So E. coli make this molecule, as well as some other um, gram-negative bacteria here. So this is iterative. We have three of each of these monomers, um, yet only two domain, T domains here. So imagine one responsible for each. 
Um, so before we get more into this biosynthetic logic, let's just take a moment to think about um, why this molecule is produced. So this is a case where we actually have very good understanding about why an organism is producing a natural product. Um, and this actually gives a segue into Joanne's section on metal homeostasis, which will come up after cholesterol um, after spring break. So many bacteria use non-ribosomal peptide um, synthesis machinery in order to make chelators, in order to acquire iron. And that's because iron is an essential nutrient, and it's actually quite scarce. So if you imagine an organism in the soil, maybe it needs to obtain iron from, from a rock. Somehow it needs to get iron from our pool, and concentrations are very tightly regulated, um, and most iron is tightly bound. And we can also think about from a standpoint of solubility, so simple KSP type things. We all know that iron 3, which is the predominant oxidation state um, in aerobic conditions, is very insoluble, right? So our cars rust up here in the Northeast because they sit outside on the road in the winter, um, and that's no good. So we can think about 10 to the minus 18 molar. And then if we think about free iron in human serum, for instance, the concentration is even lower. Um, because there's inherent toxicity associated with free iron, and you'll hear about that from Joanne in more detail later. So these organisms have a predicament because for metabolism, they need iron on the order of micromolar concentrations. So how does some organism obtain micromolar iron um, when in environments where, say, it's at 10 to the minus 24 molar? And there's a number of strategies um, that come up. But one of the strategies is the biosynthesis of non-ribosomal peptides that act as metal scavengers and metal chelators. And so I just show you two examples here. And we have enterobactin, which we're going to focus on today. And this is really just a wonderful molecule, um, Yersinia bactin. And I put this up here in part because there were some questions about those cyclization domains in the bleomycin um, gene cluster that we looked at that assembly line on Monday. Um, and this is another example where um, cyclization of cysteine residues occurs in order to give the final natural product via um, those modified condensation domains here. So if we think about enterobactin um, for a moment longer, what happens? Um, effectively, this molecule can bind iron-3 with high affinity. And the iron-bound form is shown here. So these aryl acids, these catechol groups, um, provide six oxygen donors to the iron center. And we get a structure like this here. So in terms of the organism and production, what happens when these organisms are confronted with iron limitations, so essentially they're starved for an essential nutrient, They'll turn on biosynthesis, so they'll express the enterobactin synthetase, which will allow for production of enterobactin. So this is happening in the cytoplasm. So we have those three proteins that comprise the assembly line that use DHB and L-serine to produce the natural product. And then in addition to that biosynthetic machinery, the organism needs to also um, express and use a whole bunch of transport machinery. So what happens is that this um, natural product is exported into the extracellular space. So this is a gram-negative organism, so it has an inner membrane and an outer membrane. And it's in the extracellular space that enterobactin will scavenge iron-3. So there's formation of the coordination complex shown in cartoon here. And then there's a dedicated receptor on the outer membrane that will recognize the iron-bound form and bring that into the cell, and then through um, transport and through breakdown of the natural product, this iron can be released and then used. Um, so iron's a cofactor of many types of proteins um, and enzymes here. So a whole lot is going on. Um, we're going to focus on the biosynthetic part. And so in thinking about this from the standpoint of a non-ribosomal peptide synthetase, What's something interesting? So in the examples we saw last time, right, we had the ACV tripeptide, the vancomycin synthetase. These assembly lines are only forming um, peptide bonds, right? So we saw formation of amide bonds. If we take a look at enterobactin, 
and we think about the monomers it's coming from, what do we see? So this has some C3 symmetry, and we can see that it's comprised of three of these DHB serine monomers, so one, two, three. And effectively, there's formation of amide bonds between DHB and serine, so as shown here, um, you know, and throughout here, but there's also ester linkages formed, right? So this ring here is often called a trilactone or a macrolactone, and somehow these three esters need to be formed. So how is the enterobactin synthetase doing this? So if we look at an overview of this enterobactin synthetase um, and the gene cluster, what do we learn? So the first point to make is that there are actually six proteins required. So you've seen three so far in terms of the assembly line. So we have A, B, C, D, E, and F. And A, B, and C are required for the biosynthesis of this aryl acid building block here, okay, this DHB. And then this is a case, rather unusual, where the PPTase was identified. And we're going to talk about that more as we go through the experiments. So I just told you about using SFP if you don't know what to do. Um, this is a case where the researchers were able to identify the dedicated PPTase for the assembly line. So that's NP. And then we have B, E, and F that provide this iterative assembly line that yields um, the natural product as shown here. Okay, so also just note that NB is coming up twice. We're seeing it here and we're seeing it here. Um, so that should bring up a question, what, what's going on with this enzyme? Um, and we'll address that as we move forward. Okay, so in terms of thinking about this, We'll do an overview and then look at the experiments. So we have an A domain and B. E. We have a protein here that has a T domain and an ICL domain that we'll get back to. Um, this is NB. And then here, we have NF. And then we have our PPTAs. So effectively, here we can have our initiation, our loading, and here we have elongation, and here termination. So what is the overview in terms of what happens for A domain activity, loading of the T domains and peptide bond formation? So for the overview here, um, we'll first consider um, getting a monomer onto NB, right? So NB has a T domain. Here that has a serine. The serine needs to be modified by the PPTase and D. To give polo and B with the PPAMP arm. And then what we'll see is that and E is the A domain. That's responsible for activating DHB serine or DHB and transferring that monomer to NP. So then in terms of NF. 
and getting the T domain of NF loaded, it's going to be loaded with L serine. And so here we have NF. Again, focusing on the T domain. Again, we have the action of MD. give us the holo form with the PPAN arm. And then we see that in this case, the A domain is within the same protein. So the A domain of NF is going to activate L-serine and transfer that to the T domain. So we have NF, A domain, And what about peptide bond formation? So we see the C domain, condensation domain is in NF. And so what we can imagine is that we have our NV. Loaded with the arrow acid monomer plus NF. <laughs> loaded with L-serine, and what's going to happen, the C domain of NF is going to catalyze formation of the amide bond here, okay, to give us NB plus NF effectively with DHB um, serine attached. So this gives us some insight, just this overview in terms of how the amide bond is formed, right? And pretty much follows what we saw for the ACV tripeptide and vancomycin um, biosynthesis for the haptopeptide that forms its backbone, right? So a question we have at this stage is, well, we see in that structure, in addition to these amides, there's also esters. Um, how are those formed? And then what assays are needed? And so first we're going to think about formation of the ester linkages, and then we'll launch into the experiment. Um, so let's take a look at this assembly line. So we have NE, the A domain, and B, um, this di domain that has the T domain, and here's NF. Okay? And we see in this cartoon the T domains are already modified with the pecan arm. And here is the serine residue of the TE domain that ultimately accepts um, the chain. So what happens? So we take a look. So we saw this on the board, and B becomes loaded with um, dihydroxybenzoic acid, and F becomes loaded with serine. The condensation domain catalyzes formation of an amide bond between two monomers. And then what happens? We see transfer of this DHB serine unit to the TE domain here. And then we can imagine these two domains being loaded with monomers again. And what happens? So what do we think about this? Right, effectively formation of one amide bond transferred to the TE domain. Formation of another amide bond. And look, this second moiety here is transferred to the TE domain to the initial monomer via this ester linkage. This is really unusual behavior for a TE domain. And what happens again? We see this happen again. So we get this linear trimer of enterobactin effectively. And then what happens? Chain release to form the macrolactone here. Right? So we have this group that can come around here. So what is the hypothesis? The hypothesis that was put forth by the researchers is that in this assembly line, 
effectively this thioesterase is serving as a waiting room and it's allowing um, these DHB serine monomers to wait around and remain attached such that these esters can be formed and somehow it senses this appropriate size, this linear trimer, and then catalyzes chain release as shown here. Okay, yeah. Does it mess up? Does it mess up? Yeah, like, does it always give you a three-membered <laughs> this cycle? Yeah, so this synthesis, yes, to the best of my knowledge. Um, okay. What's very interesting is that, so this is work out of Chris, Chris Walsh's group. Um, recently, Allison Butler's lab at Santa Barbara has discovered an enterobactin analog that has an additional unit in it here. Um, so it looks like there's other thioesterases around that serve as waiting rooms and can accommodate different, different ring sizes. Um, but this one will just give, um, you know, this, this size. And that, that's a very interesting question just in terms of how is this thioesterase doing that. Um, we need more structural understanding uh, to get at that. Okay, so um, in addition, these are just some overviews that I put in the notes, other depictions of um, this process and the waiting room hypothesis from the literature. Okay. So we're going to look at the experiments that were done to study this. And I, I really one like enterobactin, so I got excited about this molecule as an undergraduate, actually. Um, but beyond that, um, why I like to present on this system in terms of experiments is that many firsts came from it. Um, and it really serves as a paradigm for many, many other studies. So if we just consider the various firsts that came from the studies of the enterobactin synthetase, one, it was the first siderophore synthetase to be studied, and there's hundreds of siderophores out there, um, and many have been investigated since this one. Um, it's the first example of a siderophore synthetase characterized for the pecan arms, um, this was the first identification of a dedicated PPTase um, for one of these assembly lines. And the first identification of a thioesterase domain that has this behavior of forming this cyclooligomer. Um, and the first identification of um, an aerial, aerial carrier protein, so this T domain that um, carries DHB here. And um, in terms of the experiments we'll go through, these experiments that were devised in this system have been generalized across many, many assembly lines. Um, and the methods are still routinely used today. Um, but a major difference I want to point out is that today um, we have so many um, microbial genomes sequenced that a lot of work is driven by bioinformatics here um, in terms of identifying the NRPS. Right, so often the gene cluster may be identified well before the natural product is ever isolated. Okay, and this is a case where the natural product isolation occurred first. Um, so that, that was done well, well before here. Um, and this is a case where we know how to get the organism to pr produce this natural product. You starve the organism of iron and it will start to make it. Um, in many instances, for other natural products produced by these assembly lines, we don't know how to get the organism to actually make the molecule in a laboratory setting um, there. So there's some interesting work being done about that. Um, some actually recent work out of Northeastern actually trying to grow organisms in, in soil-like environments and seeing um, what they can be provoked to produce. Um, if you're curious, I'm happy to give you references. Okay, so where are we going to start? in terms of characterization of this synthesis here. Um, we're more or less going to follow the logic outlined up here um, for this. So here's the cartoon of the players. And the first order of business is that it's necessary to characterize the adenylation domains. So we need to ask what monomers are selected and activated. And we have two adenylation domains to consider, so NE and the A domain of NF. So what was done? Um, for NE, where we'll start, this protein was purified from E. coli and characterized here. And so how is it characterized? It was characterized by ATP PPI exchange, like what we saw for the amino acyl tRNA synthetase characterization. And so what was observed 
is that when NT was combined with dihydroxybenzoic acid, ATP, and radio-labeled PPI, there was incorporation of the P32 label into ATP, right? So that indicates formation of this adenylate intermediate um, and resulted in the conclusion that and E is the A domain that activates this aryl acid monomer of okay. this chemistry, um, which should be very familiar at this stage based on our discussions in the translation unit. So what about NF and its A domain? So again, we're working with E. coli proteins, and F was purified from E. coli. And again, this ATP PPI exchange assay was performed. And so in this case, what was observed is that when NF was incubated with L-serine, ATP, and radio-labeled PPI, there was incorporation of the radio-label into ATP, okay, which indicates that NF, its A domain, is responsible for the activation of L-serine. And so you can imagine in each set of experiments, the researchers also tried the other monomer, right? And in the case of NF, would have seen no um, ATP PPI exchange with DHB. And likewise, for NE, if they tried with L-serine, there would be no exchange, right? You'd want to see that um, in terms of making a robust conclusion here for that. So that's good, right? Now, the next question is, we need to get these monomers to these T domains here. And so that's the next step, is to study the T domain. And something you all need to appreciate is at the time of this work, there wasn't a whole lot known about PPTases. There wasn't SFP that you could borrow from your lab mate, or maybe you've expressed 100 milligrams for yourself, and you could get that PPAP arm on here. And so Joanne may want to elaborate, but there were a lot of efforts to try to figure out what, what is going on here. Many graduate students yeah. had no thesis because they couldn't get any activity of any of the enterobactin genes. Yeah, so, so Joanne. was discovered what was going on. Right, so this was a major, major effort undertaking and discovery here. Um, and so they couldn't find activity, right? And that's because these T domains needed to be modified and they weren't modified. Um, but some, you know, little detective work here. So in the analysis of purified NF, um, what analysis of this purified protein had revealed in some instances with stoichiometric phosphatanthidine? And so is that a contamination or is that meaningful, right? In this case, it was a meaningful observation that when chased proved to be very helpful. Um, it suggested that you know maybe there's a T domain here that's modified. That's something we can, can infer from this. So, if this you know PCAT arm is attached to MF, how does it get there? And if we rewind and think about what was going on at the time, um, it was only shortly before that um, the PPTase for the acyl carrier protein and fatty acid synthase was discovered. Right, so that might beg the question, is it possible that this you know, enzyme also modifies um, NF, right, if you don't know much about its substrate scope? And so that hypothesis was tested, um, and it didn't pan out. So if NF was incubated with ACPS um, from fatty acid biosynthesis and CoASH, there was no product formation. There was no transfer of a PCAM to here. Yeah? Was it obvious the uh, fatty acid synthesis, and like, I, was it called non synthesis at the time, or did it have a name? I don't think it had a name, no, but I defer to Joanne, who was on the committee, because this is really so the like first one. Analogs weren't very obvious at the time? No, it's really discovery work at this stage, right? And the question is, is there a possible lead from somewhere? And if you try it, what, what will happen? And really, there is no clue as to what is this, you know, this modification and, and the enzyme involved, right? But if you see an enzyme with activity in one system, maybe it will be active with another, maybe not. And in this case, right, it, it didn't work, but, but it was something certainly worthwhile to try. Yeah. So then what was done? 
So there was a search for another PPTase. And this was done using BLAST. And what BLAST's bioinformatics revealed um, was the identification of the enzyme NP. Okay, so here we have this NP, the PPTase here. And so MD was overexpressed and purified. So in this case, a his tag was used, a sodium column purification. And the question is, what happens if we incubate MD with an F and CoA SH? Okay. And so in these experiments, um, radio labeled CoA SH was used, and uh, radio labels are commonly used to look for transfer of either PPAT arms or monomers, um, as we'll see as we go forward to these domains. And so the question is, will we see transfer of the radio label to NF in the presence of ND and CoA SH? Okay. And so here are the results from the experiment. So we have formation of holo NF as monitored by the radio label um, versus time. Okay, and so you know what's done, the reaction is run for a given time point, the reaction is quenched with acid to precipitate the proteins, and then you can imagine measuring radioactivity in the pellet, right? Um, this CoASH will remain in the soluble fraction, and then protein in the pellet here. You can imagine control assays with no ND included there. Um, and so what do we see, right? So as said before, if we try the acyl carrier um, ACPS from fatty acid synthesis, there's no, no reaction. But look, when ND is present, we see transfer of um, this PPAM arm to the protein here. So this was a really exciting result at the time, right? We have a new enzyme, a new activity, this post-translational modification there, right? And this sort of opens the door to further studies. If you can get the PPAT arm on, then we can look at loading of the monomers here. So what's the next step, right? We have NF loaded, right, we're also going to want to try to load MD, and B, excuse me, here. Um, but of course, we need to know some more about MD, right? Um, and so, let's think about that. Um, I'll also note, right, just noted here, the next step, right, is to look at loading of L-serine on, onto this moiety here um, as drawn, right? And you can think about how, how to do that experimentally. So what about MB? This, this was another mystery um, in terms of experimental work and exploration. Um, and so initially, MB was purified and characterized for its activity that led towards the biosynthesis of the DHB monomer. Okay. So this ICL domain is involved in the series of reactions that give DHB. On a historical note, it was thought there was another protein, and this protein was named NG, that was thought to be required for enterobactin biosynthesis. And NG would be the T domain that is for the arrow acid. So effectively, it would be this T domain or arrow carrier protein um, for dihydroxybenzoic acid. But the problem was they couldn't find a gene for um, NG. And so as it turned out, um, what more detective work showed is that this, you know, NG is actually the C terminus of NB here. So they realized that NB has another role, another function, and that in addition to having um, this function and the synthesis of dihydroxybenzoic acid because of this domain at the N terminus, it's also the carrier protein um, for this monomer here. So how was this sorted out um, here? What we can do is just take a look at a sequence alignment. Uh, so this is from one of the papers um, about all of these explorations. And effectively, um, what we're taking a look at are um, known or putative phospopanthophenylation 
sites of proteins, right? So something was known about fatty acid synthesis um, and some other um, carrier proteins here from different organisms. And so effectively, if we just look at this region of the alignment, we see this serine residue is in bold. Okay, here. And this happens to be serine 245 of NB for that. So this led to the hypothesis that maybe this serine 245 towards the C terminus of NB is the site where the PPAN arm is attached here. And so this means that some experiments are needed to show that NB has this aerial carrier protein or T domain um, and that it can be modified with the PPAN arm. And it was predicted NB would do this. Um, and also that once modified with the PPAN arm, um, the aryl acid can be transferred to NB. So if we just think about NB for a minute, We have the N terminal domain, we have the C terminal domain here, and here's the ICL domain, okay, here's the T domain, the arrow carrier protein here. So we have amino acid 1, 285, here. Um, this is 188, so not quite drawn to scale. So we have serine 245 around here, um, which is the serine of interest for post-translational modification with the PPAN arm. Okay. And so what was done is that assays were performed where and B was incubated with NB and radio-labeled CoASH, like what we saw for the studies of NF. But they made a few additional constructs. So they considered full-length NB, okay, so as shown here. They considered an NB variant where the C-terminal 25 amino acids were deleted. So you can imagine they just put a stop code on in um, and deleted the last 25 amino acids. So the serine is still there, but a bunch of the C-terminal residues aren't there. Um, and then they also considered a variant of NB where they deleted this entire um, N-terminal domain here. Okay. And so the question is, what are the requirements? Well, one, does this reaction work? Does NB modify NB with the PPAT arm? And then if yes, um, what are the requirements? So is the N-terminal domain needed? Are these C-terminal residues needed? And so these are the gels um, that come from this experiment. And so what we're looking at on top are total proteins, so Kumasi staining. And on the bottom, we're looking at radioactivity. And the idea in these um, here is that we want to track the radio label. Okay. So in lane one, we have assays with full-length NP. In lane two, with the C-terminal truncation. And in lane three, deletion of the N-terminal domain. Okay, so the question is, um, what do we see from these data here? And so these give us a sense as to where the individual proteins run on the gel. Um, and here, we're looking at the radioactivity. So what do we see? In lane one, we see a huge blob of radioactivity. This isn't the most beautiful gel, actually. Um, nevertheless, there's much to learn. <laughs> so um, what do we see? Right? We see radioactivity associated with NP. Right, that's really good news. We see transfer of this radio labeled P arm. What about lane three? So what do we see there? 
also a lot of radioactivity. Right, we have a lot of radioactivity. Right, we're looking at the construct that only has the C terminal domain. Right, so what does that tell us? Shorter, and so that's why I moved down the gel further. Right, so that's why it has a different migration on the gel. But in terms of seeing the radioactivity, what do we learn? Is this region of the protein essential or dispensable? Right, we don't need this N terminal domain in order for NB to modify NB. Right, so we're seeing that. What about in the middle? That region was important Yeah, right, we see very little radioactivity here, right? Basically, almost nothing, especially compared to these spots. So deletion of those C-terminal amino acids is detrimental, and so that region is important. Um, so maybe there's protein-protein interaction going on or something with conformation um, that's important. So from here, we learn that ND transfers the PPAN arm to NB. The ICL domain is not essential for this, but the C-terminus uh, of this region is here. So now what? We've gotten here via the action of ND. Can we get attachment of the monomer, right? And so our hypothesis is that NE, which we saw NE activates DHB to form the adenylate, it will also transfer um, this moiety to NB. Okay, so in this case, what was done? Again, we're looking at um, use of a radio label. In this case, the radio label is on the DHB moiety. Okay, and this is an important point. In order to see this, we cannot have radio labeled PPAN arm in this case, right? Because that would give you a big background. So they're going to prepare and be with the PPAN arm unlabeled, right? We know that will work based on the prior study, and now we repeat that with unlabeled CoASH. And then ask if we incubate HOLO and B with NE, ATP, and radio labeled DHB. Do we see transfer of the radio label to this protein here? Okay. Let me ask a question. Yeah. This is a good question for the class. Can we do this experiment with 380-CoA and C14 labeled serine? Based on what you know about radioactivity? We actually discussed this in recitation. Does it last longer or less long? Is that not good? No, you should go back and look at the lifetimes. They're infinite compared to any experiment, so it's not lifetimes. Do you have any idea? Uh, um, I mean, so tri uh, tritium, the energy of the particle released is much lower than the energy right. of C14. So the differences in energies, you can tune, when we talked about this, you can tune the scintillation counter so that you measure tritium and C14. So people that do enzymology, as I do for a living, mm -hmm. often use tritium and C14 at the same time, and you can quantitate if you do your experiments, right? It's a very powerful tool together, actually. Yeah. So another option, the non-simplistic approach. <laughs> so. Um, basically, here, if we're looking at the four lanes, again, we're looking at total protein, we're looking at radioactivity, right, and can consider the overall reaction and then a variety of controls, okay? And I want to move forward to get through the rest of the slides, and we just have a few more minutes, but you should work through this gel and convince yourself that there is transfer of this radio label in the presence of NP, right? And this was done with unlabeled NP. Yeah. Okay, so what about peptide bond formation, right? We have the T domains loaded with the monomer. Can we see activity from the C domain um, in terms of formation of an amide bond? And so this experiment requires a lot of components. Um, so what is the experiment to look at whether or not an F catalyzes condensation? Um, basically, we can incubate 
and E, Polo and B, Polo and F, ATP, and these monomers. Okay, and what we want to do in this case is look at transfer of radio labeled DHB um, to serine loaded NF. And I guess I got a little ahead of myself on the prior slide. So this is a case where if you had C14 labels in both of your monomers, you'd have a big problem, right? So key here is to use unlabeled serine and radio labeled DHB, right? So you're not getting a big background. Um, and an important point to make here in these experiments is that we're looking for um, detection of a covalent intermediate. So effectively, um, having this guy here attached to NF, right? And so the radio label So that, that's what we're looking for, okay, not, not the final product, and that's indicated by having the gels. Um, so, so what do we see? We have the total protein and then um, the autoradiograph. And so we have polo and F and E, polo and B, right? And the question is, where do we see radio labels transfer? And if we look at lane three, where we have the proteins, ATP, serine, and radio-labeled DHB, what we observe is that there's some radioactivity here, okay, which is indicative of a covalent intermediate. And again, you should work through um, these gels and work through the different conditions and make sure it makes sense to you what's seen in each one. So finally, at that stage, the activities for all of these different domains have been found. And so the question is, in the test tube, can we actually get enterobactin biosynthesized, right, which is going to rely on this TE domain. Um, so the idea is, if we incubate everything together, similar to what was done before, can we detect the actual small molecule rather than this intermediate attached um, to NF here? And so the way this was done was by monitoring the reaction um, by HPLC using reverse phase chromatography. Um, and so here we have all of the reaction components. Here we see standards, so enterobactin. This is the linear trimer, the linear dimer, the monomer. Here's the DHB substrate. And the question is, over time, do we see in terabactin form? So you can imagine quenching the reaction, taking the soluble component, which should have this small molecule, and looking at each PLC. Um, and where you should just focus for the moment is here, so the enterobactin peak. What we see is that over time, there's growth in this peak. Um, and you can imagine doing something like LCMS analysis to confirm it is the species you expect. Here. So this is full you know, in vitro reconstitution of a non-ribosomal peptide synthetase in the test tube. Um, and it really paved the way for, for many, many additional experiments um, related to these types of biosynthetic machines. Um, and so with that, we're going to close this module. Um, I hope you all have a great spring break. And I leave you in the good hands of Joanne um, starting the 28th year for lecture.